Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Joachim Samuelsson. I am the CEO of uh, Swedish uh, tech company Crunchfish, and I am extremely pleased to be here to talk about how to implement scalable and interoperable CBDC systems today. I think the key word is today, because I think we, we have an announcement, really, that we have solved offline and uh, private payments. And uh, that is one of the key things, really, to solve if you're really going to deliver CBDC. And uh, with the strength of that, uh, it will become something of your choice of how are you going to set up your digital rail. You sort of have two choices. You actually do have a choice. I think that's the... I think to start with, I think it's, it's important to realize that you could either take the red pill or the blue pill. And I'll come back to that later in the presentation, what I mean with your choice of how to set up the digital rail. This presentation is about really three questions. The first question uh, I, I like to pose is, uh, is the question on um, why have we made ourselves dependent on the net uh, when we pay? It's never used to be this way. Uh, you know, we, we've been paying for thousands of years as human beings. And it's just during the last 10 years, really, where all our uh, digital payment service all of a sudden become extremely you know, vulnerable because they've made themselves dependent on the net. We started to question this um, and came up with this a solution for how to do offline payments, truly offline payments. We're talking about that neither not the payer nor, nor the receiver uh, is online. And, and that is one of the key aspects if you're going to look at CBDC, because quite frankly, you know, physical cash is all about offline. There's no dependency on any net. This is the solution that we've come up with, uh, our digital cash payment solution. And it's built around a two-tier, two-stage payment process. There is first an offline clearing completely offline that you can trust that you will get paid eventually. Uh, and then there is an online settlement. And this is the, this the part where we move money between accounts. We don't move any money in the first phase, the offline clearing, but we do it in the second one. To set this up, what the uh, uh, people have done is to uh, load themselves with digital cash in the digital cash wallets. There is a one-to-one -one correspondence between a digital cash account in the cloud and people's digital cash wallets. This is a function that is embedded within either a digital wallet or on a payment card. And using a, a similar sort of payment process as used by the card rails that you create a cryptogram when you're paying, we're able to uh, create a transactional tokens token uh, from a person to a person of a certain value. That could be verified offline by a receiver. So the receiver knows that I have trust in that I will get paid. Then as a subsequent step, we do the online clearing, but we split the payment process in two steps. And that is sort of uh, really one of the key aspects here. What we were very happy about is that Visa, came up with the very same idea. They pr presented a, a research paper in December last year where they were talking about that, let's move towards a two-tier hierarchical sort of structure where you first, you do an offline clearing and then an online settlement. Exactly what we've been saying for over a year. So this is a, a research paper from Visa and I put in the link there where they, they are describing that if we're really going to do this for central bank digital currency, just look at payment as a two-step process. Going into it a little bit more in detail, if we zoom into this picture, there, there's sort of three steps here. There is the step one, the digital cash wallet exchange. This is sort of the provisioning of the rules that the digital cash wallet will operate under. This is the communication between that digital cash account and the digital cash wallet. Here we, we provide for and we top up the digital cash wallet. Whatever money you have on a digital cash account is available to you on your digital cash wallet. But it could also be rules like how many transactions are you allowed to do before you have to go online? What is the maximum amount you're allowed to do? This is the issuer that would set up those rules for what you can do. Then we have digital cash payments. It could either be P2P uh, or it could be P2M. And then the step three, uh, there is the digital cash settlement. This is where we do this online settlement. This is the time when we move money between accounts. And here we have 
a settlement which could either be a pull uh, or a push. So it could either be coming from the payer that goes online first and then settles the transaction, or it could be done by the receiver. Uh, the switch will take care that we will only debit the, the payer once and we will only credit uh, the beneficiary uh, once. Private payment then, uh, which is certainly of, of interest. Uh, uh, I think we've heard in, in ECB in Europe are saying that at least from the people's perspective, this is probably the most key aspect that we have to sort of solve. And we've, we've done it because we have this sort of two-tier architecture. We've sort of solved it that we sign off um, a duplicate transaction from the payer to the payment service and then in the same sort of payment payment blob we, we can also pay from the payment service provider to the payee but it's two actual transaction and in this way you can preserve your integrity towards the bank we mask this because that's in your bank account it will just say that you have paid to the payment service and then the, the payment service has uh, just is the sort of the payer to uh, the receiver of this payment this could all, all also implement all the rules you have with anti-money laundering that if this is a too high amount, this should not be allowed. Uh, then you must uh, pay directly from payee to payee, so it's visible. But as citizens, we should be able to have a fair amount, amount of integrity. And in this sort of simple way, we, we can allow for this sort of to happen with privacy. Let's move over to the second question. This is the question really for I guess all the central banks, when you're going to implement CBDC, must your banking infrastructure really change? Is that really necessary? First thing to realize is that you have already digital money uh, in, in your country. Uh, all these, it's already, it's banking money sitting on, on accounts, that's sort of digital money. But what you're going to do now with CBDC, what you really are after is something called digital cash. And it's not the same as digital money. Digital cash is something that replicates the properties of cash. That's what you're after. You definitely want it to be an offline uh, property, just like cash. You want privacy, just like cash. And you want it to be instant, uh, simple to use, just like cash. You, you're trying to replicate the properties of cash. And that's what we mean when we talk about digital cash. So it's, that's the key thing. But you have a choice because you have already digital money today. You have it on your account-based rails. The question is, should you keep these account-based rails or should you change to something different? Because there is a lot of thinking right now. What you have to do is to change rails into a token-based rails. But do you really have to? Because if you think of it, if a company like Crunchfish have already solved offline, we've already solved privacy. When that is solved, why do you need to complicate matters to implement things on a token-based rails? Do you really have to? Because it's a huge investment, because it's not just the central bank that needs to change, it's all the commercial banks as well that need to support this sort of new format instead of just using what you already have. Here's sort of a picture of your red pill, blue pill. If you, if you go in the, in the middle there, there is a central bank. I'm thinking of a two-tier model that it's the central banks are, is the banks of the commercial banks. And then the commercial banks, they support various payment services. Underneath there, we have sort of our, our sort of architecture with our digital accounts and our digital wallets. And uh, just as I described before. But you have a choice now, because if you imagine that or offline payments is solved, you could either go for just looking at CBDC as a currency, as a new currency that could be managed on your current account-based infrastructure. The, the commercial bank do not have to rebuild in order to do this. And all your currency exchange with other countries, with foreign exchange, could use the same rails as you have today. The alternative here, if you really want to do it as digitizing the banknotes, you have banknotes today that you, you issue and you want a digital banknote and you want to keep, keep that in control and you want to split that banknote with every transaction. That means a new money format. It's not just a new currency, it's a new money format. And if you implement it that way, the blue way, then you would have to request for the banks to implement a new token-based infrastructure. And also your foreign exchange will need to change as well because the, this will not 
easily sort of mix. So you have a choice here, red pill or blue pill. We are needed in either system, as we have partners that um, sort of, uh, if we look at the, in the middle here, we have uh, a real-time payment service of Sweden. They do 3 million transactions a day, and we are in discussion with them. We have done a joint submission about implementing sort of digital cash in their real-time payment system. But we also have a partnership with eCurrency. They are, they are implementing uh, a token-based solution. They still need Crunchfish for basically representing digital cash for the offline transaction. They do it sort of beautifully uh, if, if it's all online and having it on their uh, account-based rails. This is completely their system. But if you're going to do it fully offline, then Crunchfish come in. So we're happy if it's blue pill or red pill that's not our choice it's sort of your choice to roll this out you definitely need a solution which has a lot of flexibility because you want this digital cash to uh, come around in in various sort of forms if we start under the digital cash wallet there the, the bearer instrument you want this on smartphones you want it on cards you want it on feature phones um the on the receiver side if you look at sort of in retail you want it to be able to verify this on mobile on cash regs on car terminals and and the solution we've built is extremely flexible we are not just build, building this sort of for cbdc because we are building it for any sort of payment scheme as you see at the sort of the top right here this could be on the card rail real-time payment system as i discussed before with Swish, it could be the CBDC, it could be crypto, it could be closed loop wallets or even sort of mobile money using mobile operators. Any system would do. That's the kind of flexibility that you're looking after. This is an, an, the third and last question. So why have we built sort of systems where interoperability is so hard? Because it, it, they are, payment services of today are not very interoperable. And the reason is that they're all built as online systems. Because at the critical time critical moment of payment, it is very hard to make things interoperable because things need to work instantaneously and you have to connect systems in, in instantaneously. It's possible to do, but it, it is difficult. But if you develop a system which has this two-tier architecture, offline clearing and online settlement, it is really possible to connect services in between each other. And this could be domestically, but it can also be internationally. It is no harder to get a, a merchant in Sweden to accept a Swedish payments app, uh, a payment from a Swedish payments app, than to have one in Italy. Uh, it's the same sort of technology that would allow a, a merchant in Italy to trust that I will get, get paid. And then it would be the Italian sort of payment service uh, of that Italian merchant that will just request that international sort of transfer in order to get get the money here really but we can do with our our, our product here across service cross scheme cross border cross uh, currency it, it's really a, a flexible solution here so we what we've set up here is this uh this variance uh at, at the bottom right corner we have this uh, cross service cross currency and that's sort of xsxc but you can think of uh, that it's only cross service uh same currency but cross service or this is sort of cross currency but it's only one service and we have those variants our core product uh we we had had a sort of fun when we saw it sort of xoxo and that's sort of as you know uh the gossip girl would know this from uh, uh hugs and kisses uh all i i have a brother-in-law from scotland and he always signs all his letters with this xoxo so we, we created a brand here called xoxo cash and this is our digital cash wallet that we are offering to the world really to be embedded within payment services and that provides that system of an offline clearing and an online settlement can do private payment, extremely scalable, as we've been talking about. Interoperability is there, can be on cards or mobiles. And the, the nice thing with, because we don't have a value token, we have a transactional token, it's actually possible to you, uh, use this for distributing uh, money even in, in a disaster scenario where no networks are working whatsoever, because you can even use postal mail to, to send money out. And this is ready. This is ready today. And if you choose the red pill, you could go today because you have already the online sort of rail. If you choose the blue pill, you need to build a production environment to, to sort of uh, digitize uh, central bank currencies as tokens. 